Welcome to Slash Forward. Alzheimer's is a terrible disease, but how would you manage through it if it also involved handling snakes? The Taking of Deborah Logan is a story told through pre-production footage from a documentary about the impact of memory loss. It ends up uncovering a multi-generational mystery that involves the sacrificing of children by a local murderous pervert doctor. This forces us to contend with whether Deborah's increasingly bizarre and violent behavior are symptoms of her illness or echoes from her past. To that end, we open on October 12th, 2013, and learn that we'll be following along with Mia, a young woman preparing to make a documentary about Alzheimer's. She and her crew pull up and meet Sarah Logan, the daughter of their subject, and find her to be enthusiastic about the attention. Sarah takes them around back to meet her mother Deborah, the potential subject of their film. As they talk, we learn that the benefit of participation involves getting a cut of some of that sweet, filthy grant money. Deborah's out in the woods clearing some brush with her close friend and neighbor Harris. She makes it very clear up front that her interest revolves around education only. No exploitation, if you please. But despite reassurances, the vibes ain't right, and she she attempts to excuse herself from the project. It takes a little convincing, and despite the free sample of privacy intrusion, we flash forward to one week later as the crew returns to set up. Gavin seems somewhat dissatisfied with the amenities and likes to touch and move things. Not a good way to ingratiate oneself. So Sarah gives him a little tip for keeping the wheels greased. Thank you for your um, hospitality. Appreciate it. And just in case we forgot. Remember? Well, that must. Uh, Remember? Remember? Deborah has Alzheimer's. We then enjoy a rough cut of Mia's intro, wherein she explains her intent to not only record the struggles and effects this terrible disease has on the patient, but also the physiological effect it has on the caregivers. In their first talking head segment, Deborah fusses over trying to fem up her daughter, and then they discuss some of her earlier experiences with the disease. Through some B-roll, it's revealed that Deborah is in the earlier stages of advancement. And in discussing her personal history, we learn that after her husband died, she started her own switchboarding business, making her the hub of the town and very much hot to trot in her time. As they continue to roll and follow her along during her daily routines, it's revealed that even small things are becoming complicated and that she's cognizant enough to understand the deterioration taking place. Once we've exhausted the dailies, we catch up to what they're currently filming. Just your basic run-of-the-mill gardening as unsettling as that can be, Luis also wires the house up with a variety of second unit cameras. The quiet interlude is interrupted by Deborah holding Gavin at knife point, possibly an overreaction, but she does suspect him of absconding with her personal belongings. She's consoled only with great effort, but Gavin is not so easily placated. The crew then spreads out to try to find her precious spade, which is eventually located in the freezer. Sarah hopes this will help smooth things over, but Deborah, we come to learn, has no chill. At the hospital, Dr. Nazir confirms that the disease has advanced, so she prescribes a more aggressive drug cocktail. Upon her return home, she expresses mortification regarding her behavior, and Harris demonstrates his commitment to keeping her comfortable as her condition advances. The crew not only films everything, but they also help themselves to any part of the house, even surreptitiously filming a clearly private conversation she's having with the mirror lady. Later on, as Sarah struggles to keep some of the threads of her life on track, the crew tries to provide some support. They have a late-night porch-side drinking session as she recounts some of her childhood struggles. When they head in, a strange thumping sound draws Sarah upstairs, but then Deborah's sighted floating around downstairs. It turns out that she has an ongoing concern about a man who intrudes upon her lawn, which she cares for so well. This is an ongoing hallucination that she manages in her own way. That night, the cams fail to track her as she sets to wandering, so they posse up and go searching following the trail of bloody bedclothes. Turns out, she's just doing some gardening, pursuing her passion. Inside, Mia helps her wash up and tries to relate to her, but we're given the impression that Deborah does not suffer fools lightly. They go back to try to figure out what the heck happened, and are disturbed to witness her standing in front of the oven, and then on the oven with no dropped frames. A call to Dr. Nazir the next day results in an increase of her sleeping pills, which should manage the teleportation issue. But with all these stresses, Harris pleads with them to stop the filming, but they need the money to keep the house. Once they get to day 24, we find Deborah getting fancy for another interview segment. They share the whole digging footage with her, which does not please her. In fact, it's so upsetting that, as is so often the case, <laughs> she attacks without warning. With things really getting out of hand now, she goes back for a battery of new tests, starting with a spinal tap. Unfortunately, it yields no answers. Plus, 
as she's now also dealing with a strange scaly skin infection, so they keep her there to continue testing, and she absentmindedly sheds off patches of skin, which does piss her off. Out of ideas, Dr. Nazir recommends bringing in a specialist. Hear that, Deb? You're special! We then jump to day 41, when the crew returns to the usual noises and disturbances, and they find Deborah back up to her old tricks again, eating tchotchkes. This requires them to spend some time packing up all the mouth-sized objects they can find, and while fending off snakes. Beginning to suspect something deeper is going on here, Gavin resolves to hang a crucifix from the window as a test but he picks the ghost room after nightfall, which is not recommended. He finds a series of window paintings that reveals what she sees when she gazes out, and despite this, he follows through. But it doesn't work if she sees you do it, and if you don't even close the window. Mia attempts to brush this off as best she can, but Gavin is inconsolable. As a result, she agrees to hazard pay in order to keep her crew. That night, the security cams again capture Deborah's distressed wanderings, which involve her shedding her evening chones along the way. The crew then wakes up to a loud ringing sound, they fumble around in the dark due to a power outage and figure out that her old switchboard has been activated. They follow a series of creaking doors in search of Deborah, always wary of a potential attack, and find her sitting nude at her switchboard, apparently communicating via a direct line with the devil. Before suffering a surge, the doctor makes a specialty house call and they eventually get her stabilized. Dr. Nazir then leaves them a stash of her lucky sedatives and recommends they try to verify who she was trying to contact. In the event jogging that memory loose may help her snap back into the real world. Meanwhile, Gavin did some modulation and pitch correction on the audio from the switchboard, and it translates as parcel tongue. Seeking some sort of balance, Sarah confers with Harris who brushes these recent happenings off as drama created by the producers, and even offers to help raise the money they need to get her to kick them out. When they go to check Deborah's old record books, customer 337 is missing. However, Luis is able to employ a junior detective technique he learned as a kid and uncovers the imprint of the missing page, which contains the name Dr. Desjardins, an infamous local pediatrician turned child killer. Via an Ouroboros of documentaries, it's confirmed that there were four known victims of the killer, who seemed to be following a myth wherein killing five young women would grant him immortality. The reason for his failure and subsequent disappearance remain unknown because at his house, all they found was snakes. Now armed with knowledge, they broach the topic with Deborah, who doesn't remember him well but knows that he's dead. They really would like to understand how she's come to know this, but she really would like to get to the bathroom to puke up her mineral-rich, geophagy-inspired meal, a truly primitive diet. At the hospital, the doctors continue to search for a rational explanation for all this, and Harris is seen being dragged off by police as he is unusually committed to the service of his neighbor. Further research confirms that Harris had been questioned in the killer's disappearance, causing them to wonder if he took vengeance on the sick freak, and Deborah has possibly been helping him cover it up? Not one to help his own case, Harris then shows up at the house drunk and fires off his shotgun into various objects, as one does. Sheriff Tweed arrives to help clean up this mess and says hello to her old schoolmate. The next day, we lose Gavin. The young lad simply cannot take the strain and decides to give up his hazard pay just to return to a spook-free life. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Deborah's bed is found to be empty. Security footage shows her roaming the halls with a young cancer patient. The hospital's put on lockdown, they go searching for her in every dark corner, eventually finding her in time out. Dr. Nazir is able to calmly separate the two, which makes Deborah quite angry. Desperate for answers, Sarah starts pressing the local clergy about one of them exorcisms, which he claims is pure fantasy. But we've seen enough true story movies to know he's full of it. As Harris continues to watch over Deborah, they take the next best step to solve their problems. Visiting an anthropologist, he confirms that in many cultures there are myths of spiritual parasites that latch on to the weak and infirm. He witnessed a mother take on the mannerisms of her recently deceased son for several Several months, only being freed of this hallucination upon the burning of the boy's remains. Day 60 throws us for a loop as Harris unexpectedly uses his visitation time to relieve her of her restraints. Now free, she unexpectedly begs for death, which he attempts to oblige. Unfortunately, a TV mounting mishap crushes his vertebrae. When Sarah arrives, Harris uses what may be his last chance to confirm that she was to be Desjardins' fifth victim. But Deborah spaded that sick bitch right in the neck. Then they buried him in the backyard, and it is Harris who has been covering for Deborah all these years. They rush back to the spot he identified and begin digging, but they don't find anything. Then, just like in the movies, they take one last stab at it and hit something. Rather than remains, they find evidence that Deborah located the body first. They rush back to search for the remains, in the hope that they can free her from his grasp. Some fresh soiling of the ceiling betrays the hiding spot, and Luis is the first to enter the stinky attic riddled with goo. 
Buried in the insulation, they find a smelly sack that indeed contains human remains. Assuming it to be Desjardins, they bring it downstairs hoping the burlap will be a nice accelerant to the burning. But after fighting past the snakes, and despite dousing it with lighter fluid, it doesn't burn much, but it does explode, driving them from the residence. However, when Sarah gets a call that her mom is missing again, she knows it's not over yet. They arrive at the hospital to learn a guard is being treated for snake venom, and that the young cancer patient has, once again, been mesmerized. Assuming the ritual will be completed at what Harris identified as the murder spot, they beeline to the mill with police and plenty of sedatives. They take the old fire trail up a ways and come across the evening hikers after they stop to take a breather. Sheriff Tweed tries to politely get her cuffed up real slow and nice-like, but Deborah starts spitting. Luis takes the injured officer down the mountain, leaving Mia to man the camera as they head toward the mill. There are confirmed bloody footprints leading in, so the sheriff proceeds slowly. They wait outside until a shot rings out, at which point they run in to find her, and they do find her, bloody and crawling with snakes. They pursue the sound of screaming into the tunnel system, and are eventually forced to crawl through a snake hole to reach their final destination. Mia switches to night mode after they finish scheming on Deborah, and they sneak up slowly to stick her with the sedative, but she turns on them too fast for this to work, so Sarah pulls out her strap, thinking there's surely no way this would fail. They come upon their quarry hiding behind a rock, and quietly sneak around to the other side, only to find she's masticating the child's entire head. Sarah separates them with a distraction shot, and then appeals to her mother's non-serpent side, begging her to fight Desjardins' influence. She manages to do it just enough to allow them to sedate her. Once everyone's feeling a bit more chill, they leverage these hollowed grounds to get a real fire going this time. The flames swell until they bust, and in the aftermath, Sarah is reunited with her mother. When all is said and done, Deborah suffers a rapid deterioration that at least keeps her out of jail, while young Kara's now in full remission. As part of a public interest piece, she reveals that now that she's all better, she's got big future plans. In her wry grin lets us know the plans likely involve snakes. The taking of Deborah Logan, I thought, was a pretty good movie. It had a fairly high creep factor, which can primarily be attributed to the strong performance of Jill Larson. She played her part very well and conveyed a chaotic and dangerous energy, despite the fact that she weighs about 70 pounds. It had a moment where it dragged in the middle, but then it picked back up and kept you guessing. It did a good job of telling its own story while avoiding some common tropes, but then also fell back into that groove in a couple of places. For instance, that final ending felt pretty familiar as well as unnecessary. I think the thing that likely hurts it the most is its use of the found footage conceit for its storytelling. The found footage is pretty hard to pull off nowadays, because it seems like the critical focus of that type of film usually gets reduced solely to whether it implemented that technique well or not. In this case, I didn't mind the style, but I'm not sure I would say it was done well. They put in great effort to ensure that all the shots were in camera, although I'm not sure they needed to do that. Like I said at the beginning, the footage wasn't found so much as it was raw. The premise was that a documentary was being filmed, so they could have legitimately cut back and forth between in-world footage and regular movie filming. I think this hurts it a little bit because it makes it unclear who's telling the narrative here. Mia survived in the end, but this is not her finished documentary. There's nothing set up to explain why we're sometimes seeing somewhat polished footage versus completely raw and uncut footage, and why everything we're seeing has to be in camera. I don't know if that ultimately washes out to a positive or a negative. Because I think the reason this comes across as a good found footage movie is because regardless of the style they chose to go with, there's a really good movie at its core. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.